It's the Celebrity MasterChef semi-finals, and only the six best cooks remain. You can't come in here and cruise. I'm always in it for the win, baby. Always in it for the win. Competition really has got to me. I've upped the game a bit, and I think that's, you know, what's going to be required. I think the more you get into the competition, the more it's going to hurt you if you don't make it. I don't even think a basket is big enough to contain my nerves anymore. I'm a barrel. I'm a barrel of nerves. I certainly thought I'd never make the final six. I assumed I'd be in for the first couple, be kicked out and go, oh, you know, I, I can still make beans on toast. But I'm still here. The eyes are on the prize that the final is in sight. We just have to survive a few more challenges and, and it's there. Now the pressure intensifies as their challenge to cook a favourite recipe of one of the world's most popular chefs, before battling it out for a place in the final five. I am loving this competition. They are all pushing each other. They are all getting better and better. And right now, they've got an opportunity to learn and learn fast. They want an adventure, they're about to go on a big one. Today, we have invited a very special guest. Actually, a culinary genius. And each one of you is going to be cooking one of his absolutely fantastic dishes. This chef has had a huge impact on modern British food. His cookbooks have sold more than six million copies. Ladies and gentlemen, please meet Yotam Ottolenghi. <laughs> Yotam Ottolenghi is one of the world's most successful and influential food writers. My food comes from the Middle East. I grew up in Jerusalem. We've got intense flavors. We love our garlic and our lemon juice and our sumac, you know, things that are pungent. He moved to the UK in his 20s to study pastry and in 2002 opened his first delicatessen in London's Notting Hill. His food quickly gained a cult following for its abundant and inventive use of vegetables and Middle Eastern ingredients, as well as its bold, unorthodox flavour combinations. What was fantastic about moving to London in the late 90s for me, there was a real hunger for learning about a new cuisine, about new ingredients, a whole new way of cooking. We brought a whole range of ingredients that have really been adopted by British cooks. Our spices and aromatics were really taken to heart and people loved cooking with them. Based in his test kitchen under a railway arch, Yotam spends most of his time writing and testing new recipes for his three delis and two central London restaurants. At its heart, it's a really creative process. You put ingredients together, you never quite know what's going to come out. But it's a super creative process. You've each got a recipe in front of you for one of my favorite dishes. They are slightly complicated. Make sure you read the recipe and know it really well because there are things will be a little bit left of field there, things you may have not seen before. If you follow it, the result can be mind-blowing. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a big task. An hour and 30 minutes. One great plate of food from a culinary master. Let's cook. The dishes their contestants are cooking are really not of one region. There's a lot of influences. There's a little bit of the Middle East, a little bit of Asia and India. There's a little bit of British food going on. 
I'm the son of the Middle East, but I like to look for inspiration all over the world. There are some fascinating ingredients here. I don't really know what ghee is. This is a whole new world. Dom is making an Indian-inspired curry dish of hot and sour aubergines, green beans, and crispy shallots. The aubergines sit in a mixture of intensely flavored spices. That is really the core of this dish. It has to be sour, it has to be hot, it has to be vibrant, and it has to be absolutely delicious. The curry is served on pureed urid dal, or lentils. Dal is the same as rice. It's bland, although the dal he's got is going to have in it a wacky amount of garlic and a wacky amount of ginger. That there is the base to be able to take the ferocious aubergines that sit across the top. This is not the easiest dish to get right. You really need to be very alert to little details, not to burn your shallots or to burn your aubergines, not to make your dal too dry, to season it properly. We think Dom is a kind of classic European, if not classic British. Good. Is he? Yeah, it is very different for you, Dom, this style. It is, but in a way, it isn't. I love playing with herbs and spices. Don't really do it enough. Obviously, it's something I could quite happily make a mess of at home and just pretend that's what it's meant to taste like. But he's going to know. So, yeah, there's a lot of pressure. Cut each one in the middle. OK. Very good. So you kind of you want to end up in the middle so that it looks like a, like a nice wedge. That's yeah. what I thought. Perfect. That is perfect. Lovely. Well done. Dillian is making a dessert. He'll have to make 12 perfect pancakes, which will then be filled with a flavoured ricotta, then stacked and baked. Figs and orange blossom and pistachios. These are the flavours of my childhood. And for me, those are the flavours of paradise. These hands are made for tenderizing meat, not for whisking. <laughs> Listen, know. if you can't whisk a batter for a pancake, then you're not in a good place, right? So yeah. you want to do this. And this is about like being a bit delicate with it. But the batter looks good. Have you ever done anything like this before? No, no, no. I changed away from dessert because my weight's an issue. I'm naturally a big guy, and I've got to get down all the time to under 18 stone. You're a fighter, right? That's what you are. Yes, yes, yes. You like yes. a challenge. You like a competition. You can do it. Yes. To make a really good crepe, it's really a matter of a minute or so to turn them to the other side. How am I going to flip this over? You really don't want your crepes to dry out. Otherwise, it'll be very difficult to fill and fold a filling into. Is this your first one? <laughs> yes. It's actually not bad. It's not bad. No, I'm serious. I was expecting much worse, but that's not bad. Neil's first task is to make a classic meringue for an Ottolenghi favorite, a fruit-filled rolled pavlova with a hazelnut brittle. They will have to whisk the meringue for quite a long time, so it goes really stiff and firm. And that's the key of getting this meringue right. That's not there yet. Not there yet. Add your sugar slowly while it's running. Oh, that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, hey. Follow oh. the recipe. Yeah, yeah. Don't reinvent the meringue. Presentation is really important for that roulade. It can be so spectacular but it's also about a delicate touch. I mean, not throwing too much fruit on top, uh, making it nice and neat and even. So there will be the challenge. Forever. Chef, this is taking forever. My mum used to do it like that in about five minutes. So you've never made meringue before? As a kid, I remember watching my mum do it. Yeah. Like 30 years ago, and now 40 years ago. Do you make desserts at all? No. Neil? I made custard the other day for the first time. And how was it? It was magnificent. Well, how did you make it? Butts of sugar. What thing with butter with your sugar? Butter in your custard? No. I'm not sure. Yeah. Not butter. Don't no put butter, butter in no, your custard, Jeff. No. Don't put it'd butter in my meringue, please. No, it'd be a nightmare. Please don't. If he gets the meringue right and it's still soft but cooked all the way through, it will roll beautifully. 
If he overcooks it and he gets a crust on the outside, he won't be able to roll it and the whole thing will split. You're doing well. You're doing well. I have never seen a chicken's liver before. Do I want to cook that? Surely not. That looks like something you'd throw away. Vicky is making a Jewish favourite of pan-fried chicken livers served in a classic red wine jus with toasted brioche and glazed cherries. Oh, I don't know what chicken liver should look like. Some people don't like liver, but I think it's just because they didn't have it in the right way. Ugh. And I think this dish really presents livers in the best possible way. Livers and cherries? Yeah. Something, something you have regularly? This is definitely um, new to me. Have you never cooked a chicken liver before? Never. Think about a good steak. Great. You want to brown it beautifully on the outside, but you want the inside to be a bit pink. OK, great. Thank you for the tip. You are learning really, really quickly. Can you go up to, to Yotam dish stage? <laughs> I mean, that's a big jump. That's a big ask. But I'm definitely going to give it me all. We like that. We like that. I've read a lot of Yotam's writing. He's a huge inspiration. The fact I'm going to have to recreate one of his wonderful dishes is pretty intense. Jenny is prepping sourdough bread for an almond tarator sauce. Almond tarator is a bread sauce so that we make with our roast. This instead is flavoured with huge amounts of garlic. It should be quite potent. The almond tarator is served with squid and scallops marinated in a spice paste. Really is a lot of flavour in this dish. As soon as the seafood is cooked, it goes into this spice paste and it absorbs those, those flavours and that's what makes it so delicious. A lot going on here and I'm trying not to run at this like a bull in a china shop. Try and be a bit more refined and get everything just right. There's a lot of precision. The one thing I would really make sure you do is, first of all, don't overcook your seafood. Yeah. Literally, a minute in the pan will cook them enough. And get your sauce flavoursome, but also not dry. Where This is where you have to exercise judgement, like taste, yeah. taste all Use the time. Judgment. You really need to taste. People forget to taste. Yeah. But you did some beautiful seafood in the last round. But that was more experimental. This is a tried and tested recipe by an expert, so... Pressure. <laughs> I'm quite excited to, uh, to give this dish a go. I'm going to test some of the skills that hopefully we've learned. But it's going to be, it's going to be brilliant. Greg is in charge of another seafood dish, pan-fried sea bass, served with turmeric potatoes and a southern Indian rasam broth. Rasam broth. The mixture of stock and then tamarind. And tamarind is really sharp and really sour. It should be quite powerful. And it shouldn't be too chilly hot. I enjoy spicy food. But, I mean, I've never used curry leaves before. I, I never really realised that was a thing, if I'm totally honest. How is your tamarind? It's come down to, to that state so far. Nearly ready now, because I'm just getting the other bits For ready the to, to start to strain. And, and when you strain, just make sure you get every bit of pulp squeeze off, so through. squeeze it through. OK. This is one of the most challenging dishes, really. The rasam broth can split if you warm it up too much. The potatoes can be overcooked. Even worse, the fish can be overcooked. You really don't want an overcooked sea bass. You can cook fish? Uh, I cooked fish in the last round yeah. and it came out quite came well. Nice. Um, but that was a thick piece of cod with a thinner piece yeah. of fish like this. I'm going to be sort of yeah. constantly watching. You've been in tougher situations. Oh, right? you look, I mean, look, trying to win an Olympic gold medal is quite difficult. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to lie. You don't get a medal, but if someone eats your food, and smiles, it's worth like a medal, oh, right? Absolutely. Isn't it? No, like it's the greatest feeling. The sense of satisfaction when is incredible. When somebody enjoys it. It's a virtual medal. It is, really is. You have 30 minutes left. There is a really interesting 
frenetic energy in the kitchen right now. There's lots of eager people, slightly nervous, but they now realize the enormity of the semifinals. And they're learning and learning fast. This is the aubergine and the beans and the coriander. We've got curry powder. We've got everything under the sun you could possibly imagine. This is a lot stronger than I thought it was. The flavor is very strong. The... Yeah, did you put a lot? Not even half a teaspoon. Good call. Try to use my brain a little bit. Neil is now working on a caramel to make the hazelnut brittle that will top his pavlova. Does that look good to you? It smells lovely. It smells good, doesn't it? Butter and caramel. Oh, Butterscotch. I'll be doing this at home now. Great. And Vicky's all-important red wine jus is almost ready. Definitely reduced. Can I try it? Yeah, please feel free. It's slightly on the salty side. OK, so how would yeah. you rectify that? Add a bit of your red wine, which is not salted. Add your cherries with their sweet liquids, because there's no saltiness here. How's that? It's great. Oh, and actually, parsley also negates salt. Combat it, so does chop it? up some parsley, in, but don't add any more salt. Thank you for your advice. My jus too salty. I have a salty jus. You, I didn't put on. I'm gonna chop some parsley. With his rasam broth infusing, Greg's now working on the turmeric potatoes. Have you tasted them? I haven't just yet. I wasn't brave enough. You need to taste. You really need to taste. And those are quite big pieces, so you want to break them down okay, a bit. Great. Whatever you're doing, you only have 15 minutes left, please. 15 minutes, everybody. It's going to taste nice, whatever happens. You can have a big reveal, right? It's not bad at all, right? It's all right. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Ah! Ah, my God, they're definitely too hot. Come on, Vicky. If I get this wrong, the whole thing ruined. Just five minutes, OK? The scallops are just cooking through the last few seconds now. This is slightly terrifying. <sighs> Doesn't look too bad, that. Wow, Dillian, look at that. I think we're doing OK. 30 seconds! Leave us. I want to be a baker now. That's it! Time's up, stop! Does that look like that? <laughs> it looks really good. Oh. Well done. That is awesome! <laughs> Look at him, oh, yeah. That's unbelievable! Vicky, chicken livers, come on. You're on. Knock them dead. Vicky has made Yotam's chicken livers, served with glazed cherries and bacon on toasted brioche with radicchio and a red wine sauce. I'm fascinated to try these livers. Please give them a go. Get in there. Is that what a liver should look like? Back of the net. <laughs> Get in! <laughs> <laughs> I've never had such a hug. <laughs> uh, I was worried about the saltiness. Yeah. But it's really good. It's really, really good. The cherries and the way the, the sauce is soaked into the brioche, then the radicchio is nice and charred on the outside. So really good cooking on both the livers and the radicchio. I can't fault it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Lovely sweet cherries, smoky bits of lardon. Your brioche is toasted nicely. I love the bitterness of that radicchio with the whole thing. So good on you. You've made a really good jus for the first time. You've got depth in there. It needs smartening up, you know that. But flavours and textures and touch, 
you've done it. You've absolutely done it. I got a bit stressed, didn't I? And I didn't think I was going to be able to do it. And you have said really nice things. And I'm sorry I'm being a big girl. I'm just tired today. And I appreciate you saying nice stuff and all the help you've given us so far. When you think you've had a disaster, they say you've smashed it. I don't know where I stand anymore. I'm so confused. I have culinary confusion. Jenny has made spiced scallops and squid, served with almond tarator, topped with lime segments, coriander, and chopped chili. Visually, I would like some more color on the squid and a little bit more color on the scallops as well. The tarator is a good consistency. The spice mix is good because it kind of coats the seafood and you taste all those spices. That's great. Your scallop and squid's getting lost amongst those big, vibrant flavours because you don't have that char and smoke. Because those flavours are so big, you need something quite big to stand up to it. Well, look, the cooking of the seafood, possibly, all right? But you bring me this dish and I'm just tasting it. That dish is delicious. And that bread mixture with almonds is like a sweet, salty, smooth peanut butter. I just think that is delicious. Thank you. So proud of myself. It might not have been the standard that he would cook it. Brilliant, well done. Well done. But we were getting there, and I was so happy that I got a, a smile on his face at the at the end of the tasting. Greg has cooked pan-fried sea bass with turmeric potatoes, curry leaves, and tomatoes in a rasam broth. That looks stunning. Really, really beautiful. The skin is crispy. I want to eat it all right now. <laughs> the fish, I think, is perfectly cooked. The rasam is really fragrant, beautifully seasoned. The potatoes are also got good seasoning on them, but the ones in the middle are slightly under. So it's really good, apart from that tiny little thing. The flavour of the potatoes is absolutely fantastic. Smoky turmeric and that richness of curry leaves, which I absolutely love. There's a wonderful balance of spice. It's such a shame about those potatoes, because otherwise it was absolutely spot on. That broth, I've never had anything like that broth. That is quite incredible. It starts off slightly sharp, like a lime, sweet, like a really ripe tomato, and finishes with the taste of a curry, like a korma. It's really quite an incredible flavour. And you've mastered all that, yet you can't boil a potato, Greg. What is wrong with you? Oh, yeah, I could do, do some of the basics well, but now, yeah, I'm, I'm genuinely really disappointed. The most easy part of the whole dish, and I get it wrong. It's like, it's fu infuriating. But as I say, I'll make sure for next time it's perfect. Dom, join us, please. Go on, Sam. Go on, Sam. Yeah, smash it, lad. <laughs> Dom has made hot and sour aubergine with green beans and crispy shallots served on a white lentil urit dal. The aubergine is wonderful. Mm -hmm. You've got all the spices there, the curry leaves, it's got depth, beauty, it's great. But the oridal underneath is under-seasoned. It just needed more, more flavour. Those shallots are very dark, burnt, and they're going really, really bitter, which is a shame. I quite like your dal because I like the blandness of it with all that spice that sits across the top. I'm not disappointed at all. But it's the aubergine that's the absolute star. That smoky, beautiful slipperiness with the bitter shallot I love. All in all, for my first 
time messing around with curries, I did what it said on a tin and nobody died. So yeah, I'm very happy, very happy with that. Dillian has made pancakes filled with ricotta flavored with orange blossom and topped with figs, pistachios, dried currants and orange syrup. It looks really, really good. It looks professional. This just tastes so good. Everything here is absolutely perfect. The crepes are beautifully soft. The caramelizing of the oranges, all the flavors are there. I think you did really well. Orange flower water, which is like perfume. The bitterness of orange rind, the sweetness of that dried fruit, and even that filling, which is all creamy and light, is absolutely delicious. You balance that salty creaminess with sharp fruit. Good effort, good touch. And I like your chewy, sweet raisins you put in there as well. That was good. He's a nice person, nice man, and you know, he's clearly got a very, very creative brain. Well done, Dylan. Oh. Neil, come on, bring that over here. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, Sam. Can't see the floor. <laughs> Look at that. Finally, Neil has made a rolled pavlova with mixed fruit and a hazelnut brittle. It's not dainty, but it looks so edible. Listen to that. The meringue really kept its kind of chewy texture. It's beautifully almost marshmallowy, which works really well with the cream and the, and the fruit. So you've got the texture absolutely right. Thank you. It's soft and pillowy, so like you want to put your head on it and fall asleep. But in there as well, you've got the sharp blackberries. But for me, the magic bit are the hazelnuts. The caramel's absolutely spot on because it's just going slightly bitter. And the hazelnuts are toasted enough so they're full of flavour. I think that's absolutely fantastic. Mate, you have perfectly understood what this pudding should be, and it is delicious. You bringing that enormous fruity pavlova to this table is going to be a memory I will cherish for a long, long time, because <laughs> that was a statement. I think I'm the happiest when I'm cooking. To see people like yourselves like it, I'm nearly tearing up. Yes, mate. Well done, Reza. Bring it in. Bring it on. Oh, oh my God, Reza, that looks so good. Get it. Uh. Get it. I don't think we realise how lucky we are meeting Yotam. He's one of my favourite chefs, and I'm sure he'll try and nick me and put me in one of his restaurants cooking pavlova. I thought they did really well. Have you got a couple of favourites? I think Dillian did really well. I haven't seen him work before, but I was impressed by his technical abilities and I was impressed by Greg. He was very meticulous. He's driven and he's got a good touch. Thank you so much for everything. Thank you. This was an absolutely brilliant round for our six celebs. They have learnt a huge amount. They're all right now jostling for position and every single dish counts. They can't all make it to the finishing line. Yotam, I can tell you, was amazed. We were really proud. We've given you a brief, and that brief was to dedicate one great plate of food to somebody who means something to you or inspires you. It's about a bit of love, it's about a bit of care, but it's definitely about emotion. There are six of you right now, and sadly, at the end of this round, there'll only be five. An hour and 20 minutes, ladies and gentlemen, Let's cook.
even my peening is improved. Greg has hit full. His food now looks smart and tastes good. For him now, he's got to keep it going. So the inspiration behind the dish was my kids. Milo and Rex. Having two children changed my outlook on life, changed everything, and I love it. All I want to do now is make sure I can make their lives as stress-free and as fun as I possibly can. And I think a skill like cooking is something that's really, really useful for that. What are you making for us? I'm going to make a uh, lobster and crab ravioli with a lobster bisque. It's going to then sit on some spinach, and it's also going to then going to have a jam that goes over the top of that as well. Jam? Well, this is the other thing as well. So it's called a jam, so I guess it's more of just like a slightly sweet sauce. Why this dish, Greg? My children love pasta, and I made pasta with my oldest boy, Milo. He had a great time, and I suddenly felt he's getting involved with it. Equally, I love seafood and I'm determined for my children to really like seafood. So I try and add it in ways which means that, hopefully, they won't just look at a lobster tail and go, oh, I don't want to eat that. You hide it in pasta, they taste it. So far, so good. Do it for the boys, right? That's the plan. Thanks, guys. Good luck. You consider this, what Greg has to do. He has got to roll out his own pasta. Then get it to seal around that fishy filling perfectly so no water comes in and without looking inside the ravioli, guarantee that the delicate fish is cooked. After all that, he's got to make a classic French bisque. A bisque needs to be viscous, and it should taste almost caramel sweet with the flavor of lobster. With that, Greg's got a chili jam. Lobster's sweet, crab's really sweet, bisque is really sweet. I hope the thing's not too sweet. Jenny, she's picking up little bits and pieces along the way, including some confidence. And she is a force to be reckoned with. This challenge, it's made for me, really. All the food that I've cooked really has had a story. It's had an emotional connection. It's been related to a time or a place. It has made me who I am. The dish is cockalty pie with chips, mushy peas and tomato ketchup the kind of thing you might eat on the seafront at Blackpool. Tell me about cockle pie, because I've never had a cockle pie. It's got a breadcrumb base, white sauce, cockles, and a short crust pastry top. Who's it for, Jenny? I've created it in honour of my childhood best friend, Brenda Cockle, who I met in a bookshop in Blackpool when I was about four. She was a grown-up. She had long red hair. She was very clever. She was educated. She travelled the world. She was famous. She was a singer. She was a bit of everything that I ever wanted to be. Um, and she was also entirely fictional. So she was my best friend before I made any real friends. Will Brenda like this dish? She would, yes. She likes seafood. <laughs> she likes everything I like. It's quite mysterious. <laughs> Jenny is making something I've never, ever seen before nor tasted before, cockatiel pie. Jenny's pie seems to be a bechamel sauce. And then she's got salted little cockles. Hope there's no dirt. and a short crust pastry across the top. Chips, yes, please, I love chips. Crispy on the outside, fluffy on the inside, perfect. Tomato ketchup is one of those things that everybody loves. It's slightly sweet, slightly sharp, and when you make your own, you're in danger of making more of a chutney than a tomato ketchup. I think it could be a little bit neater, but the most important thing right now is to get this in the oven. Right now. Dom loves his classic flavours and his practice dishes. But now he's willing to just push it a little bit further. Who's this dish inspired by, Dom? Well, the dedication is to my wife, Steph, who's been with me for now 23 years. And she's been a tremendous support through all the, uh, the good times and the bad times, and we've had quite a few of them over the years. As if she were beside me in my pocket, guiding me. I'm doing beef wellington with buttered purple sprouting broccoli and celeriac mash uh, with a burgundy jus. And this was the course that she first cooked just after we'd recently got married when I discovered 
that my wife really does burn soup. Tom's making us beef wellington. A fillet of beef which has been sealed on the outside, coated in puff pastry and served with usually with mushroom, duck cell and pate. But he's making a pate himself from chicken livers and mushrooms mixed together. It could be absolutely fantastic. Now, every beef wellington I've seen has got a pancake between the pastry and the meat. Dom hasn't. And I worry if that pastry hits the meat while it's wet, that pastry will go soggy and never cook properly. I sort of see the pastry as the casing that my wife sort of wrapped around us to keep us safe and together. The pate inside probably is the warmth of her heart over the rough bit of beef that is me um, festering away underneath. Just one hour left, please. For a big man in a full-on sport, Dillian shows a fair amount of dexterity, actually. There's a lot of fine work in those big fingers. What is your dish? It's like a spiced Caribbean fish with um, mango and kaffir leaf rice. It's a dish that my dad used to make. I used to go fishing with him. We used to make fish with spices. My dad used to dig a hole in the ground, heat up these big rocks and drop them in there and just cover it up. Where, where was this, Dilly? In Jamaica, when I was a kid. Happy times? Yeah, 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 yeah. Me and my dad's relationships like this, but there's some good times in there. How are you feeling about this competition about mastership. But well, you guys are hard to please, and um, I try and um, also, you know, I just want my dad to be, uh, you know, he did all right. The boy did all right. Dillian is cooking a dish inspired by his time with his father in Jamaica. The fish, lovely idea, with all those flavours of the West Indies around the outside, thyme, peppers, salt, lots and lots of paprika, chilli all together. That's fantastic. Rice and mango with kaffir lime leaves could be fantastic. Just the sweet mango and then that sharpness of the kaffir lime, I think it could be really, really interesting. What he's got to do is make sure it looks smart, because he's got a massive fish, and I mean a massive fish. It ain't no fish. It's a T-Rex. It's massive. Never seen seabirds that big before. Let's hope it tastes as good as it looks. <laughs> Boss, can I nick that? Mate, you can have whatever you want. Cheers, can I have your lobster? <laughs> Neil has been generous all the way through the competition. His food has always tasted brilliant. What he's going to do now is shine it up and make it look smart. So what's the dish, Neil, and why? Well, I'm doing calves liver with onions, bacon, savoy cabbage on a bed of creamy mashed potato, a classic. Right, why this dish, Neil? Well, I grew up in a council, council estate all my life, and we was tinned meat, and we didn't have a lot of money. And my dad finally got a job in Saudi Arabia, and he'd come home with his first wage packet. I remember me saying to him, Mum, Joyce, that boy ain't going to eat Spam anymore. He's going to be a footballer. And he bought us Carl's liver. That was the first time I had it. It was the nicest mouthful of food I've ever had in my life. And the taste was something I've never, ever tasted before. It's still there, it still takes me back. Carl's liver. It's one of those dishes which converts to restaurant food very, very well. But that means detail. Beautifully presented, creamy mashed potato, a lovely gravy around the outside. It could be stunning. We know what Neil's issue is, and we're now aware of what Neil wants to put right, and that is presentation. I lost my dad about uh, six years ago. I think about him every day. Miss him loads, so I'm just trying to make him proud of this one. Even if I go, if I mess it up, he'd be proud of me. He'd come and haunt me, but he'd be proud of me. <laughs> Just 30 minutes left, please. 30 minutes. No doubt about it, Vicky's progress has been nothing short of absolutely astonishing. The inspiration behind my dish is my wonderful grandma, Mavis. She passed away in January, and she was the matriarch of our family. 
I absolutely credit that for the reason I am the woman I am today, who I'm coincidentally becoming quite proud of. She was just a huge dessert fan. She would always say when we were in a restaurant, oh no, I, I don't eat much, I'll only have a kid's portion. She'd have a kid's portion main course so she could have a dessert afterwards. Our two favourites were cheesecake and eating mess. So I decided to marry the two together in a bit of a homage to who I think is the best grandma in the world. Quite an interesting mixture of desserts, two classics coming together. Eaton Mess is meringues and cream and strawberries. It is. Cheesecake, buttery biscuit base. Yes. And then a, a, a cream cheese topping. How do you put those two together? Your standard buttery base, and then I'm constructing the Eaton Mess on top, adding some white chocolate swirls, some raspberry dark chocolate, and, um, yeah, oh, God, some caramelised white chocolate. Thank you for reminding me. I'm going to pop that in. <laughs> what could go wrong? I'm really worried about me meringues, to be honest with you. Eating mess needs a crunch, so I've decided to try and do them really thin and really small kisses and just hope I can get them done in the time frame, because an hour and 20 is tight for meringue. There's lots of big, big flavours going in there. Chocolate, strawberries, biscuits, cream cheese, meringues, all coming together in one dish. It could look absolutely beautiful. I just hope it's not too confusing on the palate. The success of this dessert depends on the quality of the meringue and the chocolate work on top. I mean, meringues look good. Come on out, little friends. Oh, my God, it's just like a meringue! You've got just five minutes. Five minutes. Faith, little pie, you can do it. <laughs> well, I think, for me, that's pretty good. I'd be very happy with that. You have just 30 seconds left. So hot. Time's up! Stop! Whew. Well done, darling. Look beautiful. Thank you. Where's yours? Oh, oh my god, that looks amazing. Whew. Oh my god. Dillian, can we see this fish, please? Inspired by fishing trips with his dad, Dillian baked his Caribbean sea bass in a marinade of paprika, ginger, garlic and allspice and served it alongside roasted bell peppers and a mango and chive rice. Your fish is cooked nicely. And there is some big flavour around the outside there. There is garlic and there is chilli, and that allspice is almost like the flavour of mace. And you're getting, like, almost sharp lime and then a smoky bitterness. I like the flavours of it. Cooked mango with rice, but then there's kaffir lime in there, which is really, really tropical and reminds me of sunshine. And then I get the taste of the Caribbean, because the outside of that fish, it is absolutely smothered with big, bold flavours. The inspiration is from a barbecue on the beach, and that's what it tastes like. Thank you. Your dad, would he be pleased with that? I think he would, because he loved eating. He was a big man, he ate a lot. He'd be happy. I'm good, it went good. Yeah, I probably did that better than my dad, so there you go. Have that one. Put in your pipe and smoke it. Dom, please, up you come. Inspired by his wife, Steph, Dom has made a beef wellington served with a celeriac mash, garlic-buttered sprouting broccoli and a burgundy jus. The beef inside the pastry has carried on cooking. Mm -hmm. However, I'm willing to accept that this one was cooked exactly the same as the pink one on your bench. And that was perfect. The 
The pate has got a lovely flavour of rich mushrooms and those iron-rich bits of liver. I like the flavour of your pate. I'd like some more pate running through the whole thing. Your pastry is cooked, although not completely cooked on the inside. And I think that's because you didn't have a pancake around mm -hmm. it. However, your burgundy jus is fantastic. It's like having a glass of deep red burgundy without the alcohol heat. It's really nice. Fair amount of fruit in it with a mouldly bitter finish. Celeriac mash is lovely, you know, creamy mashed potato. Although, like John, I'd like more of that pate in there because that is your flavour. I'm thrilled that actually it just came together beautifully. And I do think Steph will be very proud as well. Greg was inspired by his children to make ravioli filled with crab, lobster and salmon, topped with chili jam made with tomatoes, balsamic and brown sugar, which he served with a lobster bisque made with fish stock, cognac, cardamom and chili. The filling from the ravioli is wonderful and rich. The saltiness of the crab, there's that lightness coming from the salmon and you still get the flavour of lobster, brilliant. The pasta's lovely and thin and it's not too thick around the outside, so a really good ravioli. Underneath that, a bisque which is very well flavoured, nice and rich with the flavour of lobster and sweet tomato, great. And then I get lamb busted by sugary jam. <laughs> it's an odd thing. You have a naturally sweet bisque. I don't want that sugar hit. Otherwise, a bowl of yumness, a bowl of serious yumness. And for an amateur cook, I think the way your food is going is incredibly, incredibly impressive. I hope the kids really enjoyed it, but then again, children will enjoy anything that sugar that you put in front of them. Should have noted that before giving it to two well-established judges on a cooking show. Jenny, are you coming with your friend or just you? <laughs> Oh, she's here all the time. <laughs> Imaginary friend Brenda Cockle inspired Jenny's cockletty pie, which contains cockles and a tarragon and sorrel white sauce, topped with a short crust pastry, served with parmesan mushy peas, chips and ketchup. I like the pastry across the top, but that bechamel white sauce is really, really solid and could probably do with not being quite so hard. It should be a sauce inside a pie, not something you can chop into cubes. <laughs> Parmesan in the uh, pea puree is a, is a clever idea. Cheesy peas, right? Nicely made chips, but they do need some salt on them. Love your ketchup, really sweet with a little bit of acidity, but I've got a cockle in there with some sand in it. Really? A little gritty, I'm afraid. And then you start to lose a little bit of confidence with the next bite. It's down to very fine margins, such as my sauce being a little bit too thick. The cockles needed a little bit more rinsing. I just need to up my game a little bit. Neil's late father introduced him to calf's livers, which he served with onions, crispy bacon, mashed potato, savoy cabbage, and an onion gravy. I think that looks great, Neil. Thank you. Technically, there is one fault, and that is one end of your liver is slightly rare. The rest of it, mashed potato, completely lump-free, whipped and light, well-seasoned, with a little bit of pepper in there. The onions, they're still sweet, there's no bitterness, but they are blonde and translucent, as you wanted them. The bacon's crispy and salty. Your liver's got pepper, which gives you spice. Your cabbage is cooked all the way through, but still vibrant and green and delicious. I think that's great. You've managed to get all your big flavours into a much tidier plate. Couldn't ask for more than that that you listen and learn, progress, that's great. Dad was obviously proud of you. Yeah. 
I think he'd have been proud of you cooking that liver. He would you? be. He would be. That's for me, Dad. Dad, he was a silly old sausage. He'd be watching me somewhere to cook his favourite meal for him and nail it. Get great comments. I'm sure I'd be proud of me because I was so proud of him. In memory of her grand sweet tooth, Vicky has topped her classic lemon and vanilla cheesecake with an eaten mess made from Chantilly cream, meringue, raspberries and strawberries with the addition of caramelised white chocolate, dark chocolate and a raspberry coulis. I really like the cheesecake. The base itself is slightly salty from the salted butter, which is good because the top is sweet. And then I also suddenly stumble across these little things, which I've never seen before, caramelised white chocolate chunks, which you've baked in the oven, which tastes like a biscuit. Cute, right? I quite enjoy them, yes. The thing I'm sad about is the cream is not sweet across the top in the eaten mess. It should be sweet and really indulgent, and it's not. My only disappointment, I think you could have done a lot more with the chocolate. Right, okay. I was expecting some chocolate scrolls, maybe some chocolate shards, but as a pudding lover, I love the look of it, and I really, really am enjoying the taste of it. Thank you. Would Mavis have enjoyed it, do you think, Vicky? She had a really, really strong sweet tooth. So, yeah, I think Mavis minus the cream should be all over that. <laughs> I feel like Greg liked it more than John. There's no point in sitting here saying shoulda, woulda, coulda. I've done what I did. I did an eaten mess cheesecake. I made Maeve's mess for me grandma. She woulda loved it. Look, all of them have put their heart and soul into this round. All of them want to stay. The fact is we're going to lose one from the competition. Neil did an absolutely brilliant job. I want things that taste really good and I want progression. And that's what Neil's showing. So upwards and onwards for Neil Razor Ruddock. Greg is an ambitious cook. You know what he's aiming at? He's aiming at fine dining, John, and he's not far away. An amazing ravioli. Use the shells to make a really lovely, rich bisque sauce. The jam detracted from its beauty, but I cannot in any way criticise the rest of the work that came from Greg. Dillian cooked that fish perfectly, as good as any chef anywhere. The flavours around it I thought were great. Mango in the rice with kaffir lime leaves. Good, good flavours from Dillian, good cooking. Don was always going to cook classic in this round and he did it. Beef Wellington, the beef was lovely and soft and well seasoned. He made his own pâté, which is fantastic. You and I both wanted more of the pâté around the beef. But I loved that red wine jus. That was beautiful. Vicky took two very, very classic desserts, a cheesecake and an eaten mess. Cheesecake was nicely made. The biscuit was quite firm and slightly salty. That's a great contrast. I would have liked some more sugar in that cream. However, it's a good dessert, indulgent. I would have liked more ambition with the chocolate, but it looked good, it tasted good. Jenny made for us a cockle tea pie. Any fish pie is always brought together with a lovely creamy white sauce. Instead, we had really firm and very, very hard bechamel. Now, the issue I had with Jenny, there were cockles in there that needed more cleaning. There was like a sandy, gritty feel. Who stays and who goes? Who's got the potential? Who's progressing through the competition? That, for me, is the big thing. I feel from the comments that they have recognised how much thought and effort that I'm putting in. I've done the best I can do. I just hope it's good enough. You know, we're all very much of a similar level and really still at this stage, it's anybody's game. I want to do so much, but I think this is the end of my master chef journey and that makes me the saddest little chef that ever did live.
We really do appreciate the hard work, the ambition, the drive. We wanted emotion in your food. We wanted to see some heart. And you gave it to me. You gave it to us in bucket loads. As we said at the start of this, one of you will be leaving us. We've made that decision. The celebrity leaving us is Jenny. See that coming? Oh, heat number two. Jenny, thank you. Thank you so much. I've exceeded all my expectations, and to get this far in the competition has been absolutely incredible. I had no idea until I was in the thick of it just how challenging and fun and intense and emotional and rewarding it would be. Yeah, I'm a bit gutted. Leaving those guys behind, they're going to have such adventures and I'm not going to be part of it. Final five. Wow, didn't really see that coming. For a moment, I really did think I was going home, um, but I'm delighted that I'm not. In life, you don't realise how good you can get at things. If you work hard, you know, there's no such thing as can't, there's can or won't. I can always get better and better and better, and I'm surprising myself. I'm absolutely thrilled to have made it this far. I'm going to take a lot of confidence now going forward, hopefully cook up a storm, and I leave the jam at home. Now my father think, you know what? The boy did all right. I'm the last woman in the competition, so I'm not only just doing this for myself anymore, I'm doing it for Jenny, I'm doing it for Kelly, I'm doing it for my grandma, for my mum, for Meghan Markle, the Queen. Little Mix. I'm doing it for women everywhere. Beyonce is going to be buzzing. <laughs> Next time, it's the last Celebrity MasterChef semi-final. How are we looking, Jillian? Mm, not just yet. I think this is delightful. Absolutely delightful. Only the best four cooks will go through to the finals.